I'll hold it, I guess. Thank you guys so much for having me. Um, really excited to be here and speak to you guys. Um, it's always great to talk to PC students. You guys are amazing, the best. Um, and I mean it. I mean it. Um, you were the best before we ever uh, stepped on the court here. When it first got announced that I was coming to PC, you guys probably were like, who? What? <laughs> who is this guy? Um, but from the moment we stepped on campus, you've made everyone in our program feel uh, incredibly welcome. Um, and I wanted to thank you guys. Give yourselves a, a round of applause for that. Um, and it speaks to the experience at the college. It speaks to in the classroom, in the dorms. Um, when we got here in this age of college basketball, if a player can transfer, they do it. And honestly, if you think about I probably shouldn't say this, but like if you think about it, it, it I won't say it. I, I won't even say it. <laughs> but when we got here, thankfully, the kids that we inherited and we walked into, Bryce Hopkins, Devin Carter, uh, Jaden Pierre, Corey Floyd, these very, very gifted players. Luke Fonts, <laughs> right? <laughs> like Kieran, Kieran O'Hare, like those guys didn't, Luke gets an applause and Kieran gets a laugh. <laughs> Kieran O'Hare. Yeah, yeah, yeah. um, none of our players wanted to go anywhere. Organically, naturally, like before we started recruiting them, before we started showing them video of the way we play, the way we played at George Mason in Tennessee, they didn't want to leave. And that's an incredible testament to everything that this college stands for. And it's an incredible advantage as we continue to build teams and rosters. I, I, I sent our guys a long text. I was in Phoenix for the weekend with meetings and um, I, I kept my body on East Coast time. So I was getting up really early and I sent our guys a really long text the other day. Um, and I thought it was important. Like right now in college basketball, what's everyone talking about? What's the P word right now? The portal. Every, who are you recruiting? Who are you recruiting? The portal, the portal, the portal, the portal, the portal. Who are you getting at? Portal, the portal, the portal, the portal, the portal. And, but I told our guys, like, what's truly special right now in college basketball is retention. Is retention. You know, the fact that we got Bryce Hopkins back and Corey Floyd back and Jaden Pierre back and, and Richard Barron back and Justin Fernandez back, like, and Luke and Karen back, like, yeah. that's the, like, yeah, like, we're going to get good players to replace Devin and replace uh, Ticket and Josh and, and, and the guys that, some of the guys that, that, you know, decided to leave us, but this place is special and, um, Everything I just talked about was before I even talked about the atmosphere at the Amp on game day. It's, 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 it's unreal, guys, and I mean it. And I hope we never lose it. Uh, I'm going to protect it with my life. I don't want you guys to change. I just want you to keep getting better and more crazy and loud because the support that we have means so much. It means so much in terms of wins and losses. Um, it means so much in terms of the environment that we have when we bring kids to see us play. I don't know if any of you guys came to the Garden for the Big East Tournament, but it was, it, it was incredible, and I just really wanted to come. I, I, I came to talk about Jesus, but I, I did. I did come to talk about Jesus, and I will, I promise. But um, I really just wanted to come and look you in the eyes and say thank you to every last one of you um, for all your support this season. We came short of our goal and our mission, but um, we're going to give it all we have to give you guys a team and a program that you can be proud of playing deep into March next year. So thank you guys. Um, and I'll, I'll open up for questions after this, but I, want, I do want to make a point about Jesus. Um, and I... Um, I spend time with the Lord every morning. Uh, Father Jordan's on a 
group of good friends. I text every day a devotional uh, from a pastor from Minneapolis. His name's John Piper. Um, and I challenged John Piper once via email <laughs> for his lack of speaking up when George Floyd got his neck kneeled on for nine minutes a few years back. I, I called him out and he made a post about it a few days later. Um, but this is what I'll talk about with Jesus. Um, it's this, it, it's, and surely one of the friars in here can help me. I'll stay here. Uh, what, revelations what when we talked about being lukewarm? Revelations. Well, the, the number, but I know what happens. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. I, got, I got you. I got you. I got it. I got it. I got it. So, like, it's just like, rev- and sorry, I'm. Yes. Revelations 3, 23, maybe? Ish? Rush? Okay. 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 And he says, he says, I'd rather you be hot. He said, I'd. He said, I'd rather you be cold. He said, I'd rather you be cold. Basically, and I tell this to our guys, I told it to our guys before one of our home games about not being lukewarm. Don't just show up. Don't just have your parents pay thousands of dollars for you to come, tens of thousands of dollars for you to come to college. And don't just show up. Don't just play basketball. Don't just don't just come. Don't just step on this court and go through the motions to get through practice. Right. The Bible says God said, if you're lukewarm, he said, I spit you out of my mouth. We should be on fire. We should be on fire. As people that walk this earth. If we know what. He did for us on Calvary. I can't even conceptualize it. I can't even conceptualize sending my daughter to death for sinful people. This perfect 33-year-old man who lived a perfect life, who walked a perfect life, who helped people, the Lamb of God, the Son of God, he sent him here to die an awful death for us. I'd rather you be atheist. I'd rather you quit our basketball team. I'd rather you enter the portal than to step on this court, than to walk this earth and not be on fire for Christ. Absolute fire. Um, and that's my message about Jesus. <laughs> Um, and I, um, and I'm stuck there. I'm stuck there. I stay there. I'm like, that's where I am. I'm like, he did all these great, but I I just, I just keep thinking about that level of sacrifice and what it meant to the world. Uh, I think father Jordan and I were talking the other day. We really, we took it all the way back to Genesis, right? Like it's so the Bible is so good. Like like when, when, and you got to really, you have to read it, right? You really have to read the word and what's it say when Adam and Eve, they were naked, they, they were, they were walking the garden and, and, and they eat from the tree, right? They eat from this wooden tree, like they shouldn't. And God presents himself in the garden. And you know what Adam did immediately? He hid himself. <laughs> he hid himself. And God said, Adam, why are you hiding? He said, why are you hiding? What's that? He gives him a chance to repent right then. He said, because I'm naked. And God said, Adam, who told you you were naked? He said, did you eat from the tree? So sin from that tree. Father, help me. and, and, And Jesus on Calvary returned to wood, a tree, a wooden cross, returned sin. He wasn't sin. He wasn't sin, but he took all of our sins to the wooden cross. He reached for the apple with his hand. He pinned his hands to the cross. Um, but thank God for three days later. Thank God that, that he, uh, he, 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 he defeated death. 
he defeated death so that we, thankfully, if we know him, if we know him, uh, we won't know death either. Um, so questions. <laughs> Let's see. How long do we have? How, how long do we have? 15 minutes. Let's get... Let's get, let's, let's get, let's, let's, let's get, let's get 12 questions. Let's get, let's get 12 questions. Anything, God, basketball, life, what's up? Yeah, you, what's your name? Uh, my name's Brendan. Brendan, and what year are you? I'm a junior. Junior, and where are you from? I'm from Jersey. Jersey, what part? Uh, I live in a, it's a small town, Baskin Ridge. Uh, it's spelled. Ten minutes outside Morristown. Okay. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Are you done with Western Civ? Are you done with Western Civ? You're done with Western. Congrats. Congrats. <laughs> What's your question, Brendan? My question for you is: is uh, it might be a little personal. I'm sorry if it is. Yeah. Uh, but what's your biggest day to day struggle like today uh, with your faith? Because we all we all do struggle. So what is it with you? Um, man. What's my biggest day-to-day -day struggle with my faith? Um, man, I, I, uh, being still, being still. You know, God says, be still and know that I am God. I had a long talk with one of my really good friends who's a chaplain at the University of Tennessee named Chris Walker, and he's on a rat race. He's a football, basketball chaplain. He did 55 chap chapels this season. 55 chapels and he's delivering that many messages and he's like he's so consumed with delivering a message to you and getting it across to you he's kind of lost his relationship with God and um father sometimes when I send those messages I don't read them right then I, I copy and paste because I'm going to be with 15 young men and the staff and my daughters who live in Washington, D.C., so I'm always on the move constantly. I find myself sometimes ending the day and knowing I really, truthfully didn't spend time with the Lord. Um, you know, and then there's a game plan that we have to do. And then we're on to the next team. And now there's a transfer portal. And not to mention there's real relationships that I have to cultivate and be with our own guys. So I spend so much time with, so I don't spend enough time right here. And uh, I, I, I have to do a better job of being pre present. You know, follow up. I have a follow up question. Yeah, it's just like the uh, White House press briefing. But <laughs> let's go. You get one follow up, okay? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, what do you do to, to kind of mitigate that? Um, yeah, I, I, don't know. I do try to. Yeah, I know. I do try. I try to get on my knees and read that message before I send it, you know? But sometimes I'm all over the world and waking up in different time zones and I'm, uh, you know, uh, I do spend a lot of time listening to praise and worship, you know, Maverick City music, but that's different than the word. It's the word. Like, I think you have to be and you can pray. Prayer is great. But the word, you know, I think is, is so important. Great question. That. Yes. Come back to you. Yes. What's your name? Where are you from? What year? Um, I'm Callie Harvey. I'm from Worcester, Mass. And I'm a junior. Okay. Callie, what's your question? Were you always like very strong in your yeah, I was strong in my faith. I grew up in the church. I grew up in the church. My mother's uh, AME, African Methodist Episcopal. My father's Baptist. I went to Catholic school growing up, Calvert Hall College in Baltimore, Maryland, and Towson Catholic High School in Towson, Maryland. Um, so I was always around the word. We're in college. You know, I went to church a lot. Uh, um, I, I, I kind of midway through my career, I stopped going to church as much. Uh, but when I stopped going to church, I actually got closer to the Lord. When I went to church, it was kind of like I would just listen to the message on Sunday. And when I stopped, I tried to spend time in the word every day. Um, you know, I, I, I did grow up in the word. When I was really, really young, I thought that I wanted to be a preacher. Um, but when I got into coaching, this is my ministry. Coaching is my ministry. These players are my congregation. And I kind of feel like I'm living it there. 
Yes, sir. I have a question for you. Yes. So, What's your name? What grade are you in? <laughs> what year? I'm Nico. Nico, nice to meet you. Freshman. That's right, sir. Where are you from? I'm from Los Angeles. L.A. Wow. What high school? St. Francis High School. Where is that? Is it in L.A., like the city, or where is it? Like, well, yes, but it's in La Cunada, which is its own city. So. La Cunada? La Cunada. La Cunada. Okay, I don't know that school. <laughs> so, no, I, I, I used to work at Colorado. We were in a Pac-12, so I'd be in, I, I was in L.A. a lot. I was in L.A. a lot. Um, uh, Bishop Montgomery. Bishop Montgomery High School. And uh, it's by the airport in Torrance. You know Torrance, California? J. Sarah High School in Orange County. Modern Day in or Orange County. Yeah. Um, yeah, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> I don't know your high school. You guys must not have great basketball players. Did you guys have good, you guys had any good basketball players in high school? Yeah. Who? Uh, Andre Henry. Next. <laughs> Robert Ory got thrown out of our. Robert Ory. Robert Ory. Really, really. We're talking Robert Ory. Nice. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. What's your question? Everyone knows you're under a lot of pressure. You and the team both. So I guess when things aren't exactly going your way, you feel like might not be meeting the expectations uh, the crowds or the school or the media puts on you and whatnot. Uh, and I guess you get down and whatnot and you might you or the players might lose morale. How do you how do you what do you say to that and what do you say to yourself to get them and whatnot to keep keep their heads in the game and just give a little bit more? Yeah pressure is a privilege, right? Like I don't see I don't feel any pressure. I don't feel like there's no the, the most ardent Providence fan ever. Right. The most supportive booster ever. The most whoever. No one wants to win the game more than me. No one puts more pressure on themselves than I put on me. So outside pressure really is the thing. And um, in this field, in this game, you don't have time to even spend a second thinking about anything that doesn't lead you to success. So the way you alleviate pressure is by focusing on your opponent, right? And it's, it's, a, it's a goal to aspire to as a player to get to this place, right? You get to this space, and you know, UConn has it right now. They have it at an elite level. We're going to get it. It's where when you cross that timeline, right, the half-court mark, and I'm on defense, all I'm thinking about is playing in a stance – with my most focused and locked in mindset with my four other teammates. And if it's a shooter, getting to him with a high hand so that he can't shoot a three, not allowing him to get middle, knowing that if he drives baseline, I have a teammate right there ready to stop his drive. It's, if it's a shooter, closing out with short feet and a high hand so that he doesn't drive past me. When the ball moves, I move. Fight through screens. If it's an off ball screen, be there on the catch, don't get curled. If it's a ball screen and it's a shooter, blow it up and get over. Know that our five man is going to be there. If he shoots a shot, contest a shot without fouling. When the shot goes up, don't look at the ball. Look at someone as they come. You put your shoulder in their sternum and you try to break their sternum with a hit. You box out. You go get the rebound with two hands. You chin it and then you play offense. Right? And then you cross the timeline as we're going. The first seven seconds, if we can get a layup or an open three, we get it. When you pass, you cut. If the ball gets in the post, get to our post spacing. If they're double teaming the post, get to our double team spacing. You pass, you cut. If you're open, you shoot it. If you're not, you do what? Pass it. If you're ready to shoot, someone runs you off the line, you drive by them to go score. If no one stops you at the rim, lay it up. If someone does stop you at the rim, give it up. We're going to shoot the ball. One guy's going to sprint back. Three guys going to crash the offensive glass like their lives depend on it. If we don't get the rebound, we run our absolute hardest back and we cross the timeline. And then you just do it again and again and again. If I'm thinking about that, I don't have time to think about pressure. Right. If we play a game with that mindset and our best shooters take the most shots, our best finishers inside take layups. If we make our free throws. And we, we, we don't give teams open threes. We don't give up offensive rebounds. We, pressure doesn't matter. We know if we do that enough, we'll win the game. So 
pressure is a privilege. So we don't feel any pressure, you know? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I just have to say, that was like, you were talking in a different language, and I was like on the edge of my seat being like, and what do you do next? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. What's your name? I'm Abby. And where are you from? I'm from New Jersey. And what year? And I'm a senior. Nice. Yeah. So, um, my question is, what's one word that you would describe your team, and what's one word that you would describe prior time? Well, um, for this season's team, I'd say resilient. Say so they were a very, very resilient team. Um, Justin Fernandez tore his ACL last spring. He was supposed to be a rotational player for us. You know, um, we were, we're unfortunate to lose Alan Breed. He was a rotational player for us. Uh, Will McNair decided to transfer in September. He was a rotational player for us. Bryce Hopkins tore his ACL uh, January 3rd. Or six, he was a uh, our leading scorer, and our team never flinched. Josh Aduro had his baby born while we were at <laughs> Butler, um, and he was a very big rotational player for us. Uh, but they never flinched. They never flinched. Richard Barron played this season with a torn labrum. He had surgery on it today. Wow. Uh, um, they never flinched. They never flinched. Um, and they just got better and better and better. Um, a word to describe Firetown is a uh, very hard one word, but loyal. So loyal. And it feels so good to be a part of it. Like, I get it. The massive chip on our, this, this small college in the smallest state, in this small city, uh, in between New York and Boston, but with a voice and a heart that is massive. You know, we played a preseason tournament in the Bahamas, and there's the University of Georgia, it's like 20,000 undergrad, University of Kansas, Kansas State University, which is like a million undergrad, <laughs> and Miami, which is actually a pretty small school, maybe 10,000 or 15,000. But this little small college <laughs> in New England, absolutely took over this gym in a resort in Bahamas. <laughs> and we lose to Kansas State, double overtime game, play better, fights, it was crazy. <laughs> we lose by three in overtime, and I'm walking back to my room. Like, when we lose, I'm embarrassed. When we lose, I think, I'm serious when I'm about to tell you, I think I'm going to get fired the next day. I'm serious. Every single loss, I'm walking in like, uh, like it's the worst feeling ever. It, it's the worst feeling in the world. I don't go to lunch on campus. It's like, I'm, I'm like, I'm like, I don't deserve, like, it's the worst feeling to lose. And I'm walking back to our, our, our hotel room. I'm just having my head down. I'm just like embarrassed. I don't want anyone to see me. And Friar fans are like, coming out like, Great game. I'm like, what? <laughs> like, you got them tomorrow. We'll get G Georgia. Uh, an incredible feel and vibe. And the next day, again, we just lost. I'm walking into the game. I'm like, it's nobody going to, no one's going to be there. Let's just lock into our process. Just play well. We'll win. And we walk onto the court and you would have thought we won the last game. Like more Friar fans there. I mean, it, it's incredible. <laughs> I mean, we lose, we, we're, we're, we're fighting for our NCAA tournament lives. We lose a game to Villanova in the end. We, uh, we're fighting for our NCAA tournament lives. We lose a game to UConn at the end. I'm going to the garden like, this is just ridiculous. We're playing on a, we're playing Georgetown and it's going to be no one there. I'm just like, all right, let's just stick to our process. We, we walk out on the garden floor and it's packed with black. And fr Friar fans everywhere going to the game, banging on our bus. <laughs> we win. We win the game. And it's like everyone's like, get on, get, get to New York, playing Creighton. And we beat Creighton. More Friar fans. We're going back to the hotel after the game. A Friar fan ran next to our bus. <laughs> I'm serious. From the, the garden is like 33rd and 7th. Father, is that right? He ran from 7th 
to First Avenue. <laughs> he followed our bus from 7th to 1st. Then we go south. You know, we stayed downtown, uh, but loyal. Very loyal. Very loyal. Yeah. What's your name? Win. How do you spell win? W-I-N-N? W-I-N-N. Nice to meet you, Win. What high school in D.C.? Gonzaga. Gonzaga. What year you graduate? Okay. You know Devin Dinkins? You didn't know Devin Dinkins? What about Nick Lewis? No? Okay. <laughs> All, right. All right. Derek Dixon? <laughs> Derek Dixon? No. no. Nice. All right. All right. Okay. My my pregame speech, um, you know, it's not monolithic. I try to be pretty even keel and focused on what we have to do, what the task at hand is. Sometimes I get excited and, you know, fire and brimstone and go get them. But um, uh, our assistants actually do most of the talk in pregame. I come in for a second and just clean up what we have to do and get right to it. So it's not like the movies. Every once in a while, I'll get excited and fired up, uh, but it's pretty simple and get to it. Now, halftime's a different story. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yes, Callie. Um, I was wondering, what, like, what inspired you to want to do this on and off the court? And also, like, is there a place or, like, where do you see God every day? You know, is there, like, a time or place or, like, someone where you see God in? What inspires me off the court? Um... You know, I don't, you know, maybe this is sad. I, uh, my inspiration comes from the game. It comes from the game. I, I want to see our guys living their wildest dreams, playing in the NBA, us cutting down nets, hanging banners. That really inspires me. That's the, like a lot of people say, like if there's a saying in golf, like, or boating, like it beats working, like a bad deck. That's not the case in my profession. Like, I, I think a good day coaching basketball is pretty better than a good day of golf uh, or on the boat. Um, you know, my daughters inspire me outside of basketball, seeing them learn and have uh, success and have joy and smile and be happy. Um, you know, that inspires me um, to just make sure they have a better life than I did. And um, yeah. Whatever they want to do, I don't, whatever they want to do, I just want them to be passionate about it um, and give it their all. In the back with the shades. Yeah, you have shades on. <laughs> I don't know why I'm holding the mic to my ear like it's going to help. Uh, sorry. Um, my name is Arjun. I'm the director of service and business program. Um, and what year are you? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. Sorry. Great question. Um, it made me a lot softer as a coach. I immediately, when I had my daughter, I was my oldest daughter, I was an assistant coach at Colorado in 2017. And um, who said that's your school? You went to see you? No, but I went to Brimfield. Where you live? Brimfield. I used to live in Brimfield. Did, yeah. <laughs> Did you go to Holy Family High School? Yes. See, you got that. <laughs> Uh, so I uh, yeah it made me a lot softer as a coach I, I immediately when I had kids I started looking at every one of my athletes like they were not my children but they were someone's children and how would they want to be spoken to how would their parents want them you know uh, to be treated whenever one of our athletes is having surgery I'm there with them you know Devin's thumb Bryce's knee you know um, Richard this morning I actually missed but Nate was there I was traveling back uh, Nate was there um, you know I, I just another thing having daughters did and it's it shouldn't have taken me to hear daughters for this but it did it's the truth and it's uh, us I listen to music differently and music that I allow to be played in our facility. 
um, and I'm, I'm ashamed to say it, that I, it, had, it shouldn't take someone to have daughters to listen to certain degrading lyrics and music, uh, but I disallowed certain lyrics from songs in our facility um, when I had daughters. Um, and it'll go on forever. Um, um, yeah. We talk about respect a lot. Respects, really, and that transcends everything. People respect everyone. Look people in their eyes, say thank you, shake their hands. Everyone. And um, you know, I want to get to a point where our, our athletes are doing that at an elite level on campus, respecting everyone and getting respect as well. It's a two-way street. Great question. Yes. Okay. Yeah, um, that's a great question. Um, love your neighbor as you love yourself. That'll help on the basketball court. You know, thou, sh thou shalt not lie. You know, don't lie. You know, be honest in, in everything we do. I talked about being hot, not being lukewarm being on fire, playing with passion. This ability that our student athletes have is a gift from God. I think he wants us to use that gift to bring him glory. You know, it's not pressure. Our guys are playing for an audience of one. Actually, actually plan for an audience of one. You know, we say the Lord's prayer before every game. We say the Lord's Prayer after every game, win or loss. Father Noel probably thinks we say it a little too fast. I probably agree. <laughs> um, but if you really break down that prayer, that's next year, bring me back. We'll break down the Lord's Prayer uh, line by line, line <laughs> yeah. like line by line. It's 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 uh, it, it's it's what it's all about. Um, so we, um, you know, we, we, we bring our faith to the court. Seriously. A few more questions? Maybe five more questions? Yeah. What do you got? Uh, my name is Drew. I'm a freshman from Delaware. Nice. And, uh, what high school? Uh, Louisiana. What is it? So Louisiana. Okay. I don't know any players from there. <laughs> um, my question for you is where did the mindset motto come from and how are you going to implement it on the team next year? Yeah, we got to get better. We, don't, we, we, we didn't have an elite mindset this year. Our guys were resilient. But it's something you build. It's nothing you wake up with uh, because it is different. We're asking you to actually do everything that's against human nature. It says mindset, but it really should be an elite mindset. So that is a humble mindset. When everything is going right for you, when you're scoring 30 points and winning and ranked and like, what's your mindset coming to work the next day? What's your mindset when everyone is telling you how great you are? What's your mindset when you score a big basket in a game on someone smaller and everyone else does this? Oh, too small. Like, 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 no, you score the basket and you sprint back on defense because humility, because respect. We're not trying to show up our opponent. Um, what's your mindset through adversity? A no call, a, a referee doesn't make a call just sprint back and I had a few technical fouls so my mindset wasn't <laughs> the, the, the best but that's when you know we have it my last team at George Mason it was turning the mindset was becoming elite my players would come to me during the game and clap twice and say yo mindset and that it's supposed to put a trigger in your mind to get back on focus human human nature sets in not ask you to be per perfect you know, but we're asking you to respond to injury, respond to pain, respond to adversity, respond to success with an elite mindset every day. A mindset of focus to execute a play perfectly, to not have any game plan mistakes. You know, so it's a it's a it's a it's a it's something we're trying to get to. You know, a few times this year, I told T.J. Grahams, our director of basketball operations, I told him I wanted him to cover up the sign in our practice gym a few times this season. But John Sweeney, it was like $10,000 uh, 
uh, per forklift in the Ruane facility. So I said, okay, we're not going to cover it up. But, you know, I, I, I wanted to cover up my set a few times this year. Um, you know, I, I, it's, it's, uh, it's not there yet. You know, and it's a lot less of a motto and it's going to become a mantra, you know. So, yeah. Four more questions. My man right here. I picked him, but we'll go ahead, Rob. No, you're good. I, 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 no, you're good. You're good. You're good. Let's do it. Yeah, you. I, I did pick, but we'll go with you, Rob. Yeah, my, uh, my name's Rob. Um, I'm a sophomore. I'm originally from Rhode Island, and then I moved to Naples, Florida last year. Nice. Um, so my question for you is, um, if there is one Bible verse that strengthens your devotion the most, which would you say is? Yeah, I mean, I'm going to go back to Revelations 3, 23, I think, uh, what it is. Um, I'm stuck there. You know, I'm stuck there. There's another one. Uh, you're going to help me again. Um, maybe Acts or maybe 2 Corinthians. We serve a high priest who knows he we serve a high priest who knows everything he's won everything we don't yeah yeah uh, passed through the heavens Is that hold on That's <laughs> hold on one second rob Okay, here we go. You're right. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. That's maybe more me a few years ago. Whenever temptation or anything was said, and I would think about that in the moment, like, yo, <laughs> Jesus felt this. <laughs> And didn't do it. <laughs> he didn't say, it. you know. Um, so that was more a few years ago. Uh, really, really, really thinking about that. And it even it, it went further. It talked about how uh, the word, Father, uh, it said it's sharper than a two-edged sword. Two sword, and it can something about bone marrow. It could cut through marrow. So basically, right, the word, the word is like a sword cutting out that temptation and that sin, it can cut it out of your flesh because the flesh is weak. Use the word as a weapon as you aspire to walk the earth as Christ did. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. My name's Kelly. Kelly. I'm a sophomore and I went to NDP like in Maryland. Notre Dame Prep. Yeah. That's what's up. Name, Come on, NDP. Do you know what some, some older players, a lot older than you. IND. Is that close. Yeah, yeah, yeah. IND had really good players. Right. Yeah, well, let's go ahead. But, um, so I feel like you came in and so impressively became close with all the players and the school, but in spe like specifically the players, how does that relationship, like the close relationship you have with them, motivate you and like keep strengthening the team? Yeah, it's everything. It's everything. And it's something that I think I can do a lot better job of. I kind of watch other coaches sometimes during a game or a big moment I look and I, so like, like I, I'm like judging. Like I think he's closer to his team than I am. <laughs> and I hate that. I don't like that feeling. Sorry, I don't hate. I don't like that feeling. Uh, so it, it, it's something that you have to work on every day. And I want to be closer and closer to our players. Um, but it, it's, you, you have to work at it. We talked about it with the team. It doesn't happen inorganically you have to be intentional and work on that every single day and I have to work on it I'll continue to work on it but uh I think it's the most important thing because as a as a play as a player players don't care how much you know until they know how much you care and from a player standpoint with each other if you have a real genuine relationship off the court it translates to really good stuff happening on the court because you'll naturally just have your brothers back and play selflessly. Great question. Three more questions. Right here, black shirt, black hat. <laughs> so uh, my name's Colin. I'm a sophomore from Durham, 
Massachusetts. Okay. And uh, my question is, like being in the same draft class as like guys like uh, Andre Drummond and uh, Chris Middleton. Love to glance down. <laughs> Andre Drummond, Chris Middleton, Anthony Davis, Damian Lillard. So like playing against and being teammates with those guys at like the elite level, how was that like impacted? Or your coaching philosophy. Yeah, it did. That one and a half, one season and some change in the NBA had as much of an effect on my mind for the game than any basketball ever. I learned more and like I envy, I envy people that can spend time around the game. Right? Like I sit there, Rick, I'm 35 years old. Rick Pitino was a head coach at Providence 36 years ago. Like I in like how much knowledge he has in his mind from all the pictures and patterns he's seen in the game, I crave it. I crave it. And I got bored playing overseas. I got bored in Europe because I, I wanted more. Like I, I, I need to constantly feed my, my basketball uh, um, thirst or hunger for information and knowledge and experience. Um, but it was great. Uh, Chris, watching him blossom into an all-star. Andre watching him continue to recreate himself and find ways in the league. And other guys in the class, Damian, uh, you know, Draymond, Anthony Davis, Brad Beal, still having great careers. Um, you know, it just, and it gives me a little bit of motivation to still play with my guys, you know, on the court, just see if we can still hook it up a little bit. But, uh, no, I learned more in the NBA than I learned um, any stop before this season. This season has been the only season of me learning as much as I learned my uh, one season in the league. Two more questions. You two, I love your spirit. You guys play rock, paper, scissors. Who goes first? One round. Rock, paper, scissors, shoot. Okay, you're first. Yeah. Okay. Hi, uh, my name is Sam. I'm a sophomore from North Providence. We're already here. Nice, of course. That's right. Do you go to LaSalle? North Providence High. North Providence. Oh, Ernie went to North Providence High. Yeah. Sorry, I had that wrong or wrong. Sorry. Don't worry about it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> my question to you is, where do you, what are your thoughts on kind of the future of college basketball? NIL getting bigger and bigger. Yeah. People get more involved. Is it becoming less intimate with people with the transfer portal being huge? Is it hard to keep the team together? Is the respect getting lost with money being influxed in? Kind of your thoughts. Yeah. Um, you know, I guess we'll see. I'm not going to let the integrity of our program be bastardized by uh, money. Uh, I think it's good that, that players can earn now. And the college and our fans have done a great job keeping us competitive in that space. We can get any player we want. Um, you know, but we're not going to get players that money is the most important thing. Uh, because the opportunity that you have, you know, Devin Carter didn't make the most money in the Big East this year. He was the Big East player of the year. But he's going to make a lot more money than a lot of players in the Big East this past year. That's what it's about. Uh, it's the opportunity on the court, the opportunity to showcase your skill. I mean, if you do that at a high level, you'll make money. Real NIL money, like Caitlin Clark. It's real NIL. It's really your name, image, and likeness. You know, not money that our donors have raised to give to you to come play here. Uh, so I'm not going to allow our program to be bastardized. Um, if we lose kids, so what? Uh, we won't lose the ones we're not supposed to lose. And, uh, you know, I'm excited about the changes because what's great is our leadership at the college Steve Napolillo, Father Sakar, John Sweeney. Um, there's no status quo. We know we have to evolve. Yeah, if you don't evolve, you die right now. And uh, we're evolving at a rapid pace, and I'm really, really excited of the alignment we have at Providence um, from the top to me. Uh, I didn't think about it really, truthfully. It had no impact on us and our team. Um, you know, we played a whole lot of games before we got to that game. 
Um, you know, obviously it was an emotional game for Coach Cooley coming back to a place he'd given so much of his life and career to. Obviously it was emotional for some of his former players. Um, I focus my attention on our players on the team. I was much more worried about Corey Floyd uh, you know, playing against his former coach now for a second year in a row. He had to play against Dan Hurley two seasons ago. I had to play against. It's much more concerned about Bryce, Devin. The, 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 it was them. You know, I was really focused on them. I was hoping that our environment stayed safe, and it did. Um, and then on to the next game. So I really didn't spend much time thinking about it. Um, college is very dramatic. Um, you know, <laughs> Coach, I told the players, you're going to want to play in the NBA one day. You probably won't play for one coach your whole career you probably will play against your old coach at some time. So we actually use that game as practice. We use that game for practice of what it's going to be like when you're a pro. And um, it was a great game. It was crazy. I had so many DMs for tickets. <laughs> I had one girl say it was her birthday. I didn't believe her. She sent me a picture of her ID. <laughs> and I gave her tickets to the game. Uh, so many DMs for tickets. <laughs> but uh, yeah, appreciate you guys for having me out. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.